Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Smith. This is ModX Network Voices. I'm a professor also at Washington State University. Uh, I'm joined by my partner, <clears throat> Ivan Rupnik. Ivan, like to say hello. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, Ivan is a professor at Northeastern University, uh, and together we have a, this consultancy research education uh, and outreach related to uh, offsite and industrialized construction. Today, we have uh, the pleasure of hearing from a guest, uh, Professor Thomas Bach. And Thomas, <clears throat> who I've known for a number of years, uh, is a, quite a pioneer in the space. He's gonna tell a little bit about his story and also uh, what he's been working on. He's the chair for building realization and robotics at the Technical University of Munich. He's also an archi architecture professor. So that, that's a soft place in our heart for architecture professors. Um, and he's uh, of course, editor of many journals, uh, very active in the space internationally and shares uh, a history with Professor Matsumura that we have had on, the, on this show. So with that, Thomas, uh, I invite you to uh, introduce yourself and share your screen and go through it. And then we'll have a question period after that. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Ryan and uh, Ivan for introducing me. And actually, I'm now in Munich in, in my construction robotics lab, which, which I established about 23 years ago at TU Munich. And uh, I took over some lab from the mechanical engineering faculties and uh, I changed it into construction robotics. Also the chair um, was newly established. It didn't exist before. Uh, but I not only have an architecture background, I also um, in civil engineering, I was at IIT Chicago. Um, as a Fulbright scholar, I studied about the uh, skyscrapers those days. The Sears Star was the tallest building in the world. And um, um, okay, and I have also um, another degree from United States, but nothing to do with construction. I'm a commercial pilot. Uh, oh, wow. I got my pilot license, commercial license in Dallas, Lafield. Uh, that's the famous airport where John F. Kennedy landed before, unfortunately, he got shot at. <laughs> The small airport in Love in, in, in Dallas. Yeah. So, um, and of course, I have the doctor in robotics, uh, construction robotics uh, from University of Tokyo. So, uh, um, you can check out more on when you Google my name and uh, now. Yes. Yep. Okay, thanks. So, anyhow, uh, I already introduced myself. I have backgrounds from Germany, from uh, Chicago, and from Tokyo in three different uh, disciplines, architecture, civil engineering, and, and robotics. And um, I'm focusing now on, on the robotic part of uh, prefabrication, modularization, and on-site uh, construction. And uh, this was the, the one of the visions um, uh, we, we had in earlier times, but this is uh, mass production, which is not so flexible and not acceptable anymore. So I, I by myself, I have uh, worked a lot in the industry. And first, of course, uh, in Germany, where I was born, I worked at uh, precast concrete uh, factories uh, for all kinds of buildings in, in Germany. Those days, it was still a little bit more handmade, mechanical. Then I also got an experience in Texas. And in those days, it was one of the most uh, innovative uh, uh, companies, in my opinion. Um, it was called uh, Concrete Modules Incorporated in San Antonio. I was there in 77. Uh, and uh, I was also involved in, this, in the planning of, the, of one of the administration buildings of Texas A&M in College Station. First kind of uh, modular building, very innovative those days. They also ma made bath kitchen units and so on. Uh, then I spent some time in I Iran. Um, I had the task to, to do 60 schools in uh, prefabricated concrete panel systems, but um, after we set up the factory and uh, we planned uh, different sites uh, all over the country in, in Gom, in Isfahan, Shiraz, Tabriz, Mashhad, uh, Rasht, and so on, uh, the revolution started. So I had to get out of the country very quickly. You know the rest of the story. 
Um, also, I learned a lot in France. Uh, um, I worked at a company which is called Coignier. Um, there was an interesting engineer. His name was Camus, and he used to work for Citroën. And um, he introduced lots of this car manufacturing technologies of Citroën uh, into the prefabrication of, of concrete panels. So this was 41 years ago. And when I had my own office in, in Stuttgart in Germany, I also did uh, several buildings uh, all over Europe. Uh, one was maybe also interesting in modulars is uh, in, in Spain, in, in um, Barcelona. And I used also one of the most advanced Spanish uh, construction companies in big cast concrete panels. I show you the concrete part of it because uh, you don't see it so commonly in the United States. Uh, I also built in wood, in timber, uh, but the timber are, is more common in the States, so I don't show you. Um, so I show you something which I think is not so common in, in the United States. So here's the factory in, in Catalonia, in the north, uh, northeast corner of, of Spain. Uh, Catalonia is one of the technical highly developed uh, uh, districts of Spain next to the Basque district. And, um, and then of course, uh, I also uh, went to Japan. And the reason why I was going there was when, while I was in, in Texas at, at the Zagbe company in San Antonio and later at, at IIT in Chicago, I heard about the Sekisui system and the Toyota home system. And uh, so I decided I have to check it out myself. Uh, so I, I went in 84 and I decided to stay five years. I got my doctor there. I first studied the Toyota production system with Toyota Motor Corporation. Then I changed over to Toyota Home Corporation. Also analyzed other companies like uh, Misawa Homes, uh, uh, Sekisui House, Sekisui Heim, Daiwa and so on. Uh, Professor Smith, he knows all of them as well. And uh, um, then I came back to Germany, first to, to Paris. I, I had some job for the French uh, CNRS, which is a kind of national research association. I set up a French national commission on, uh, on uh, construction robotics. We built the first uh, construction robots in Europe. Then I got a call for a new professorship, civil engineering faculty, University of Karlsruhe in 89, which I started uh, also a new, totally new professorship. And I developed a multifunctional prefabrication system for also again, uh, precast concrete panels. So um, um, the difference here you see here is that that one unit uh, manufacturing unit consisting of two gantry robots could build all the components for a whole house so you don't need assembly lines anymore as in conventional uh, construction prefabrication companies but you have a, a manufacturing cell which is very flexible that can do all the components the wall components floor components roof components for the whole building. So this was a kind of innovation. And the flexibilization came through the robotics part. As you can see here, this was the first robot manufacturing prefabrication robot system, uh, maybe in, in, in at least in Germany or maybe even in Europe. And here the robot putting, placing in the, the reinforcement and then uh, distributing concrete and cleaning it and also the formwork and so on. Everything was robotized. Here the concrete distribution and the demolding. And we also could do some uh, bath units, something similar to what, what I learned, Sacri company in San Antonio before. But this time it was done by robotics in San Antonio. We still did it manually, uh, prefabricated manually in the factory. Uh, but now here it's done all automatically with uh, gantry robots. And we set a speed record. We built this double house, uh, twin family house in eight hours. And all the components were made on the same manufacturing cell, which I just showed you. Um, I also had a kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, non-executive uh, 
supervisory board membership for technology on, on the, those days, it was the largest German housing company. Um, they made about 5,000 housing units uh, a year. And, um, wow. and it was also low cost. It costed about, uh, uh, in Euro would be one house, uh, 40,000 Euro, maybe 50, 60,000 dollars, which is quite less money for, if you compare it with uh, exploding housing real estate prices now in, in Germany and all over Europe. So it was affordable. You could finance this almost like a car. So uh, it was affordable and flexible and rapid manufacturing. Uh, I also was involved in some of the difficult prefabrication. Uh, you know, the famous American architect, Frank O'Gary, um, uh, he, he won a competition um, in Germany. And then I was betting with some uh, biggies from the construction industry that I can build it with robotics. And they told me, you can I never do it. And uh, so there were three buildings. I, I was in charge of one of the buildings. I bought the software from an aircraft company in France called Dassault, which is something like Bombardier in Canada. Uh, they make business jets or Lear jets type of airplanes. And uh, since I got my commercial pilot license in Dallas, I, I always check out the aircraft technologies or space industry. So I got the aircraft uh, manufacturing technology from Dassault, which is called, uh, was called those days, uh, 25 years ago, it was called uh, Katia. And I grinded out the negative form uh, from the formwork and then we pour in the concrete and set the reinforcement. So each panel was differently. And then it was assembled, just each different shape, three-dimensionally shaped building was assembled very quickly on site and I won the bet against the um, <laughs> other people of the, they, they were actually more experienced than me. I was a young professor those days uh, in my mid thirties and uh, nobody expected I can do this. Uh, but anyhow, we won the bet because of this uh, software from the French aircraft company. Um, and also here you see the uh, latest 3D printing we did. We 3D printed using also again aircraft manufacturing 3D printing devices uh, for printing this uh, component here, which is about two and a half meter tall, one meter deep and one meter 50 wide, but it took too long. It took about 120 hours to make it a uh, couple of years ago. Now it would be maybe 40, 50 hours. It's still too long. The manufacturing time is kind of slow for 3D printing. So I just recommended it for certain parts, not so big parts, uh, but it's a fashion now. Everybody wants 3D printing. So it depends. Um, I trust to do it for small confined pieces, parts, uh, not for the whole building maybe, but that's just my opinion. And uh, this of course, you know, from Professor Smith, uh, the, the factories in Japan and most advanced in the world. Um, the original system was developed by Dr. Ono, Katrigo Ono, and uh, he did his uh, doctorate at the same place where I did mine. And um, it was actually an outcome also from the student revolution time. And uh, so very innovative uh, uh, doctor thesis, which became reality and a famous big company, very successful. Here I compared during my doctorate different systems I experienced in Europe, the United States and Japan. I compared the production time on site versus factory production time. And um, so I found out that, of course, a mobile home like you have in the US mm -hmm. is very quickly installed. And then maybe you might have the modular steam units like 6300 home, <clears throat> then the large panel size like we use in Europe, <clears throat> the small panel size, this is more like a 63 house or post and beam or conventional like a brick building like typical in, in Germany or some part of Europe. And here you have the production time uh, on the on the on the left side in uh, on site. So it's always a balance between off and on site. Um, but I'm trying to combine best of both worlds and uh, uh, use robotics for speeding up and at the same time having flexibility. And this is uh, shown here. So. Um, 
you can uh, develop new systems because of the manufacturing uh, technologies. And um, this is part of my PhD, which I wrote uh, uh, 42 years ago, finished it, submitted it in, in University of Tokyo. And I was also working on this uh, uh, part-time in this company who did the first uh, construction robots in Japan and also the first automated construction site. And you see here the cover, I also contributed to this uh, automated construction system. And my task was the joining, for example, of the columns and the beams and the floor panels and the facades and the uh, services. Like here, you see the details. Um, this was a part of also um, developed for, for this company to, to join the columns automatically by robotic assembly. Here is the same transfer to German technology, brick laying. But if you place a brick on, on the site, it takes quite long. So I decided to prefabricate brick walls. And the bricks had been specially made for robotic prefabrication assembly in the factory. And also they could house reinforcement and all kinds of water pipes and heating pipes and services, including, for example, the water closet here for the bathroom. So you would have a highly prefabricated value added component to be shipped on site. So um, this was uh, one of the developments. This is a, one you know probably from Professor Smith. Uh, here I was also a little bit involved uh, and uh, in, the, in the rapid joining. And um, so this house could be assembled in four to six hours. Uh, very quickly, already high prefabrication ratio um, um, depends how you count it, 80-90%. Kitchen already installed and so on. And we develop our own system now for, for European projects, uh, also for energy efficient buildings to be affordable by uh, automation and robotics. Uh, here is the second volume, uh, Robotic Industrialization. Here I focus on the, on the robotic part to make, to make the, uh, in fact, to customize uh, the large scale prefabrication. So here you see again an example of, mm -hmm. of Misawa Home in, in, in Japan. And the one I did in my laboratory in civil engineering faculty, University of Karlsruhe before. And um, here is one of the three dimensional uh, robots I developed for the company uh, to make the bathrooms. So this is uh, in fact the automation part of what I experienced in the late seventies in San Antonio in Texas, but now is automatically prefabricated. And here, focus on the on-site robotics. Um, I was also involved in this robot, the guide rail, uh, considered in the facade, so the robot could guide, could travel along easily. So it increased a little bit the cost of the facade, but it reduces the cost of the robot. So when you consider the whole life cycle, um, it becomes cheaper because um, um, you already have it installed for, for painting, for cleaning, for repairing, and so on. And here's some example of, of the first uh, robots that had been developed. I was involved in some of them. Uh, for example, this uh, floor finishing robot, this suspended ceiling assembly, this uh, spraying uh, fireproof material spraying robot, and this facade robot. And here you see the suspended ceiling assembly prototypes and different robots in Japan. On the right side, a uh, robot which I developed in Germany, the first uh, actually European robots. The, the blue one up here is mechanical and the red one is totally autonomous. Could telescope up to three and a half meters so over about 12 feet maybe and do some um, ceiling work, also installing uh, not only suspended ceiling, but also installations, air conditioning ducts and so on. And this was the first uh, European mobile on-site masonry robot. Uh, the problem was the Europeans didn't have this experience I had, so they didn't believe me 
So they made me use existing construction material, as you see here, limestone block, which is typical for Northern Europe, like Scandinavia, Denmark, Northern Germany, Holland. And um, this block was of, made, of course, for manual assembly by masons, but uh, it's not suited for robotic construction. So what happened was that the end effector became really complicated because I couldn't use my experience from Japan, uh, robot-oriented design uh, of any kind of materials or components. I had to adjust the robotic technology to this uh, construction system material, which was made for manual construction. So it became very complicated, a little bit like when you have the horse carriage, uh, you take away the horse, you uh, uh, exchange it by an engine, and uh, then you try to, 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 to be very, uh, go anywhere with, with your car, it doesn't work. So you need a totally new system. You need, you need road network, you, you need fuel stations, and then the car technology takes off. But if you just have a horse carriage, like the first cars without horses, and then exchange the horse by an engine, it doesn't work. So same thing happened here. Um, but we made it work anyhow. And here you see the family of an interior finishing robot system, which I did one robotic system for Germany. And it's, it's a basic module and it has additional working modules to be placed on top of the robot. So it can do all kinds of uh, interior wall, uh, roof, uh, floor tiling, wall tiling, and, in, and uh, ceiling assembly. And here's the real one working now in my lab and also on the construction site. Also, I'm advising the Singapore government. They also <clears throat> want to introduce robotics uh, in 10 years on the construction site. Um, they got a problem with, with, uh, with foreign labor. There was some civil unrest. Uh, there was some uh, for Singapore conditions, uh, some construction workers got drunk and they burned some police car and this nothing happened, uh, but uh, just the car got burned, but the government decided in the long term, we want to get rid of the foreign construction workers. So I, I did the roadmap for 2030. Here you see a robot we did for Hong Kong uh, three years ago, um, also for SAID a painting robot for social housing, high-rise buildings in Hong Kong. Here we built in my lab, mm. the first prototype, and then we delivered it to Hong Kong. And it's now presently not running, but it was running before the uh, unrest happened. And presently we have a robot, uh, the worldwide first eight cable suspended robot for facade assembly. Here is the first uh, uh, prototype cage testing. Um, and here is the end effector installed in the, in the yellow cage for assembling the facade. And this, this end effector here you see in this yellow cage was developed in my laboratory. And here is the, it's a very flexible end effector. It can suck itself to the existing facade and then it can place uh, first the joints, drill the holes, install the joints to attach the facade and then attach the facade to the building. It is now just uh, finished uh, assembling um, a facade near Madrid, Toledo in Spain. And my assistant, he built this end effector and he just came back two weeks ago from Spain, having finished the first construction site uh, with the first worldwide first uh, eight cable suspended robot. So the robot can move in any direction, also in, in third dimension, which was not possible up to now. Here you see it, um, the eight cables and how the robot is holding a panel and uh, assembling the exterior wall. And then the next step is integrated automated construction site. It's a little bit like a vertical shipyard <clears throat> I was also involved in this building. It was built in 92, 93 in Nagoya, Churoku Ginko building, a bank building in Nagoya. 
And uh, in 84, 85, I did the first sketches. Uh, I couldn't still speak the language in Japan, so I was the only foreign member uh, among Japanese who developed the first robots. So I sketched my vision and it actually happened uh, a couple of years later, except for the Zeppelin drone robot, everything happened. Also in Singapore, uh, before um, I also advised the Singapore government for prefabrication for social housing and on-site automation. Here is the finishing. We now in, Hong in Singapore, we achieved 95% ownership ratio, 80% social housing, 15% private housing. It's not boring at all. It's very nice, pleasant to live there, high living standard. These are the people from the authorities. Uh, um, and uh, and I was the one who made this, uh, the strategy. And we, this is one of the la latest the social housing areas. And the next will be the robotization for on-site. And all what you see in the background is all prefabricated um, housing. And uh, I want to show you about the first prototype of the automated construction site. Here I was also involved in, in 88. Uh, a final year also of my doctorate at the University of Tokyo. And here we tested at the company uh, research laboratory, we tested the first uh, prototype of the automatic construction site. On the right, you see it's running. Here's the inside, here the design, robot-oriented design of the joints for the column assembly, panel assembly, floor panel assembly, facade assembly. Here you see the floor panel assembly. Um, and the uh, exterior wall assembly, interior wall assembly, and uh, services assembly, which is very difficult. But I copy a little bit some tricks from the shipyards, and then I assemble the whole bunch of uh, pipes and services. Another system developed by a competing contractor in Japan was first to build a roof on the ground floor and then push it up. Also, some technology from shipyards have been used with huge hydraulic presses to check up the whole building up to 15 floors. This had been also copied by a Swedish company. I took several uh, Scandinavian delegations to Japan and they decided to copy some of this Japanese system, but make it a little bit different. They used large panels in concrete panels like we use it in Europe up to 12 meter lengths. And this is the first in the Swedish uh, construction site. And here how it's been pushed up. It's not automatically, it's tele telecontrolled. And another construction site in, in Holland, in Netherlands, the largest medical center in Rotterdam. Um, I decided to, to propose to them to use the system, develop the system, because if you install a tower crane, you have to consider a falling angle of seven degrees from the hook of the of the crane, which means the medical center had to stop operation services, and so which cannot be possible. It's the, one of the biggest medical center in Holland. You cannot shut it down just because of the construction of one building. But with this method, without tower crane, um, they could run the medical center, and this building was the uh, was faster built than scheduled. They were two weeks finished ahead of schedule, and it was the most precise building ever built. Uh, only three millimeter deviation for 135 meters of height, which is uh, pretty good. Also similar things in, in China. Um, first test of, uh, I became the advisor of the Ministry of Construction in China, and also here, um, the Expo Shanghai. Uh, first, the pavilion built in a day, similar like uh, what Seki Sui did in, in four to six hours. Uh, here a little bit longer, but also a little bit bigger building. And then later, different uh, taller buildings, 10 floors in five days, uh, 20 floors in 10 days, 30 floors in two weeks, and, and almost 60 floors in three weeks, quickly assembled. And the trick was also the robot-oriented design of the joints to assemble this hotel very fast. This is one of the recent sites uh, in Osaka, um, also an automated uh, construction system. 
Uh, so each year about one system is running, as you can see it here. And we developed some idea for another Chinese uh, company. Uh, it's still uh, on hold now, and um, we hope it's gonna start again in the future. And interesting is also the deconstruction. Um, when I was in the States, uh, they used a lot of implosion. In Europe, we used the wrecking ball, but in Japan, they developed this kind of cut down system. So they can recycle 93% of the material and reuse it again and even extract some rare metals from this uh, debris. And um, here you see different buildings being disassembled, headquarter of the company, here another uh, office building across the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. And this is how the demolition site looks. Just check it out yourself if you see a demolition site. Um, how it looks, and this is a demolition site, you cannot imagine how clean it is. And even this famous hotel designed by Kenzo Tange was also disassembled systematically, this time from top down. The previous one was uh, cut on the ground floor and then lowered, but this is from top down, recycled, disassembled. And here another one in, in the middle of Tokyo, without dust, without noise, slowly the building, disappears and over 90% of the material can be recycled. And when you check it out in the future, you just can get these books. Also Cambridge made some uh, eBooks because now we are teaching online. Uh, I didn't show you the ambient integrated robotics uh, because um, it's, uh, it's more for the aging society. I choose the background. I like Chicago skyline uh, because I was there for one year as a Fulbright scholar. I, my professor designed the Sears Tower and the Hancock Tower. So this is um, the skyline. In front of the Chicago skyline, you see a workstation for elderly or physically challenged people. And uh, I call it Ambient Integrated Robotics. Even when you are confined to a wheelchair, you can contribute to the society. It's about inclusion. And this is for me, the continuation of robotics. First, you build something, you prefabricate something, then you assemble it with robotics, and then the robot, uh, the building becomes the robot itself. So this is about, I call it aimed integrated robotics. So um, in the United States, maybe you don't have the problem of the aging society because you have a lot of immigration, but in, in Germany and Europe, we are facing, and especially in Japan too, um, we, we face uh, rapid aging societies. So they are very eager to introduce some of these systems. And you can check out my homepage. Uh, uh, here is uh, about 13 videos. And uh, you can, it's all in English. And the videos are also in English, uh, French, uh, Japanese, and German. And here, my research gate uh, profile or LinkedIn profile. And, uh, and of course, the Cambridge books, um, which we will do another volume next year. And uh, also, um, there are about 500 other publications, uh, articles. Uh, you can check it out on my homepage. Okay, so basically I'm through with it and I'm ready for taking your questions. Thank you, great, Thomas, um, appreciate it. Uh, go ahead, Ivan, and start off, that'd be great. Great. Uh, yeah, Professor Baca, that was uh, really fascinating. Um, and have, I think having experience uh, both in the US, Germany, and, um, and in Japan, is really valuable uh, for what, some of the research that we've been doing too. So I'm going to start with a question um, about sort of comparing Japan to the rest of the world. Japan is one of the few countries we've seen in our research, and we can correct this if we're wrong, where uh, high automation and robotics uh, are included, not just in innovative projects, but are fairly, fairly widely used in mass construction. So double digits of mass, uh, mass housings, we see the use of robotics. Um, and we haven't seen that We've seen that technology in Germany. We've seen that technology in the US as you've shown it's been around for almost 40 years. Um, what, what do you see as the obstacles um, to the expansion of higher automation and robotics 
uh, in the mass market? Uh, or, or is that even is that even something that uh, we'll see, whether it's in Europe or in, in the US? What's what's keeping that technology from expanding the way that it has in Japan? Yeah, I tried to a little bit uh, indicate it when I showed you the, the first robot I built in Europe, the first mobile Mason robot in the 90s. Uh, the problem was that the, or still is, that the construction materials, the construction components are made for manual assembly for human assembly. And, uh, and all the standards, uh, industrial standards are made for conventional construction. So, um, and, and also um, as, as soon as you have cheap labor available, um, it's also um, no incentive to invest in machinery. And uh, this is, I could experience in Texas because I spent one and a half years in Texas and in the seventies, Zachary was very uh, innovative company. Uh, therefore, I went there, and they were with the with the concrete modular uh, incorporated. They were maybe the best company in the world, according to the information I had in the seventies. But later, they could use cheap labor from Mexico, so um, they called it the wet bags. I don't know whether this is politically correct. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> in our days, but it, I'm talking about the seventies. So please forgive me. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, so uh, when as soon as they employed cheap labor from wherever they came, they they stopped using uh, mecha mechanization. And uh, in Japan, they don't have this, this uh, reservoir of cheap foreign labor like they have in the US or they have in Europe. Uh, so the pressure uh, uh, for automation or for rationalization is very high. So um, you have higher labor cost share. So you need to, the pressure uh, to, to automate is much higher. So. Uh, but still you have the problem of the standards that don't exist. You have the, let's call it, uh, um, I mentioned the carriage or the car. So uh, it, it's like the first car, the word car originates from carriage, horse carriage. So they omit the horse, they replace the horse with a combustion engine. But the first cars, uh, when you check it um, 100 years ago, they looked awful. They're not so successful. Okay, 100 years ago, it already was pretty good with this with Model T of Ford. But before that, let's say the end of the 19th century, they really looked like a horse carriage without horse. And they had no road network. They had no fuel stations. You had to get the fuel in, in, in the pharmacy and so on. So uh, you need a whole ecosystem. So once you have set up the whole system, and then, of course, the technology will take off. But the problem is in construction, the innovation cycle is very slow. The life cycle of the, of the products we do is, is very long. So when you compare it to a bakery, uh, if you don't like the bread from a bakery, you don't go there the next day. But in construction, it might take 50 years or longer till you get some feedback. So um, this is also one obstacle. But I think in the future, it's, it's picking up more and more momentum now because in, in, in Europe, we have a um, labor shortage. First, we had a unification of Germany when the Berlin Wall came down. And uh, then it happened similar what I experienced in Texas. Uh, the German industry used cheap labor from Eastern Europe. So somehow they, they fall back, actually, in technological development. So. Um, Nowadays, also these cheap labor from foreign countries from East, South, East Europe, uh, they want more money too. So now the German industry has a problem, what they're gonna do. So we have a lots of uh, problematic construction sites in Germany, like the Berlin airport and, and the Elfenhammerny in Hamburg or the Stuttgart main station. Uh, with years of delay, several times cost overruns. And uh, so, um, there's a bigger urge now to, to rationalize and uh, to do things better and, and uh, slowly moving into more prefabrication. And later after prefabrication, you will have the on-site rationalization. So it's a nat natural development depending also, also because like Singapore, I mentioned Singapore, why the Singapore government wants to have robots on-site because also the virus is speeding this problem up. So 
in Singapore, lots of infection uh, came to Singapore because of the migrant workers. Uh, there were about 300,000 construction workers from India and other countries working in Singapore. And they also had to stay uh, in their sleeping containers. They were not allowed to leave uh, and go work on the construction site because they brought the virus. So the Singapore government, not only because of social tensions, but also because of the virus, they are pushing now um, after they succeeded in the prefabrication, now they're pushing for on-site robotization. So there are many, many developments now uh, that are uh, very good for, for this kind of rationalization, modularization and on-site automation more and more. But maybe related, sorry, and related to that though, because of the labor issue, one of the other things that we found very interesting was that uh, Soseki Suiheim, which has been, as you've shown, been using robotization for quite a long time, uh, but has also been using highly skilled labor with that robotization, uh, tried to set up a factory in Thailand um, with, this, with the assumption that they could um, overcome the lack of skilled or any kind of labor in Thailand with, uh, with robotics. And what was interesting was that they eventually had to bring uh, Japanese skilled labor to work with the robots. Um, and is that, is that something, I mean, that there's also seems to be a, a need for, uh, one of the assumptions that people sometimes, and you haven't made this assumption, but that we hear in, in the industry is that we can replace skilled labor with robots. Uh, but it was interesting to find that at least in their case, in fact, highly skilled labor and robots worked quite well, at least in the Sekisui example. Is that something you've seen in your, in your research? It could be also uh, not only replacing workers and, and you need, all, of course, you need skill up, you need new skills, but also new it skills. can help to include uh, people who have normally no chance to work because they are not skilled enough. For example, um, automation robotics can help. It's like, like driving a car. Uh, First, you have a manual gear shift, gearbox, and, and then um, you need some skill to drive a car with manual gearbox or gear shift. And when you have an automatic transmission or now maybe autonomous cars, anybody could drive it. Uh, when, when I did my commercial pilot license in Dallas, uh, uh, for me it was good when I was an experienced uh, pilot in, in Dallas, Love Field. Um, you, you, you know when you fly along and you, you turn on the autopilot and then you can check the navigation chart. Those days when I learned it, there was no GPS yet. So I had to really check the navigation charts. So um, you, you switch on the autopilot and while the airplane uh, cruises along, uh, you check uh, the navigation where you are and so on. So it can help people who, um, who are like me, I was not experienced in the beginning. I just had, uh, let's say 100, 200 hours flying time. So um, the same can happen also with people who are not skilled. So once you, you develop an advanced uh, system and uh, it can, of course you need skilled people, but also you can integrate, include less skilled people. So I think it's, it's a win-win situation. It just depends how we use the technology. Thomas, um, maybe as a last question, uh, given time, and that is uh, much of the construction in the United States and in Europe is low rise construction. I appreciate all the work you've done with the high rise construction in East Asia, which is important. Uh, with low rise construction in the US and something that we're focusing on more and more, uh, whether it's light gauge steel or light wood frame, we have seen uh, a proliferation. If you think about the innovation curve, right? You have, I wrote it down here, innovators, early adopters, or the diffusion innovation curve. Innovation, innovators, early adopters, uh, early majority, late majority, and then laggards. And much of the work you were showing is really in that innovators category, right? It may not, it may not be as, adopt, as much adopted. The rate of adoption may be fairly low. But a big rate of adoption is certainly in the panelized technology, whether that's like Weinman equipment or Randec equipment that gets put in these, these home building factories. Uh, but we still, and that's happening more and more in Europe, we're still seeing it lag in, in the United States. And um, although some have started to pick it up, um, 
Do you have any ideas about why, say, a modular company or a home building company would not invest in uh, a panelizing process, the automated factory, uh, the automated machines to panelize walls before they go into modules? Um, have you seen, is it still the labor issue or are there other cultural um, barriers that, uh, that exist? Because it certainly has been proven out, say, in Sweden or in Japan. Well, yeah, in Japan, of course, the culture is already there of prefabrication from the traditional Japanese uh, building timber and so on. Um, and in, in, in Europe, uh, or uh, I think we might need a different kind of little bit, we have to change maybe the industry. We have a lots of uh, construction companies that do everything by themselves, in, even if they are small. For example, um, let me compare it to the American car industry. When you, when you visit uh, Detroit, uh, you can see the Ford Museum uh, for, for the cars development. It's a very nice museum. And, and those days uh, when Henry Ford started, I think there were about, I don't know how many car companies, 180 or more car companies in the United States, even once I was invited, in, invited to Caterpillar in, in Peoria, in Illinois. Um, and even Illinois, even Peoria, a small town, I think when I went there, they only had 150,000 inhabitants. I was so surprised. Even Peoria had its own car manufacturing company. And this was all around the United States. So uh, of course, they didn't work very well because one small company makes one car, it's, 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 it, it doesn't work. Now we have the big three or five, we have Toyota, we have General Motors, uh, Chrysler and so on. And um, um, uh, there's a different structure in the industry and, and there's a specialization in the industry. So if each construction company does the whole building, of course it's difficult, but there might be a new, new industry developing Little bit what happened in the, in the car industry or also in the shipbuilding or in the aircraft industry. Same thing with the airplanes. You, you check the airplanes, you had Curtis, he made great engines, and then you had so many other um, aircraft companies uh, similar like the car industry. And now we have only Boeing, Airbus, and, and so on. So um, there, you have lots of suppliers, they specialize on certain components, for example, or sub-assemblies. And if, if we do this in the construction industry, then of course you suddenly get economies of scale for certain type of, 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 of uh, companies uh, that specialize. But if, 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 if they go on like this way that they do everything themselves, uh, even if they only have uh, 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 five employees or 50 employees, of course they never, um, can, can invest much money, uh, but if you would set up a company that does components for let's say 100,000 houses and uh, the exterior walls, for example, suddenly you get economies of scale. So it depends how you structure the industry. So I see more and more um, this development slowly uh, starting from bottom up, for example, I'm just renovating an old house I built as a student 40 years ago. And I just now insulate the roof and just the insulation, um, the heat insulation of the roof developed quite much. The, the overall process of construction didn't change much, but the material level uh, developed a lot. So slowly they are moving. Of course, they're very, very slow how they develop and it could be faster in my opinion. Yes. And so, uh, but um, they slowly develop from the, from the construction material level towards more complex components. And then we will have uh, panels, we will have a highly finished value added panels and later modules and so on. And in the end you get the whole system, but it, it, it takes a while. Uh, I'm a little bit not patient enough uh, because I'm already 63 years old and I'm in this business for 40 years. So I'm a little bit uh, uh, worried, but uh, for the young generation, uh, for my students, for my assistants, I think it's a good time ahead because in the future, also probably your, your students in, in 
Washington State Universities, they will have a very good future because this kind of skills are needed in the future also in, in the United States and uh, in Canada as well, because you will also move ahead and uh, a similar situation, what I described Singapore, which is a city state. Of course, it's a very special situation in Singapore, but you can see it, you know it from your own experience from Japan and, uh, and also Scandinavians, they are a little bit uh, more advanced so, um, so we have, uh, I think we, we, we have, uh, this is the only way to go because nobody wants to do the hard labor anymore. When you talk to young people, they don't want to join the construction industry anymore. It's hard labor. And it was also for me the reason because when I built as a student my own house by myself, do it yourself, I started thinking and I happened to see the first welding robot at the Daimler-Benz factory south of Stuttgart where I also made some money during my studies. And I started thinking, wow, that's maybe it. And then this made me going into, into mechanization, robotization later, and, um, and so on. So I studied uh, technologies in France, in United States, in Japan. And um, I think you also first have to experience yourself how hard the labor is, manual labor, build yourself, and then later <laughs> you, you will end up in, in mechanization, rationalization, robotization automatically. I want to thank uh, Professor Thomas Bach at Technical University of Munich for sharing his 40 plus year experience and career with us, um, real pioneer in the, in the space. And we appreciate uh, you giving in, of your time and preparing a presentation today, uh, Professor Bach, and hopefully you keep in touch. Thank you for uh, your, your sharing on ModX Voices. Okay, thanks. Take care. Thank you.